welcome back. I'm really, really, really looking forward to this conversation today with Bob DeCoke and Phil Clampett. Bob and Phil, how are you today? Great. Doing well, Michael. Glad to be with you this morning. Thrilled to be with you today. And why don't you share a little bit about both of your backgrounds and we'll dive into this conversation that's really, really important. Oh. Yeah, I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay, and I've been studying communication, leadership, and organizational effectiveness literally for my entire career. And I've been fortunate enough to team up with a, uh, an executive that I greatly admire and respect. And the uh, opposite is true for me. I'm on the uh, corporate side of this uh, team. Uh, I've been in management and leadership, corporate leadership, all my career and uh, several different companies, large and small. And Phil and I got to know each other now almost 30 years ago and we started to write together. So this is a team that's actually collaborating and working for a long time, written two other books together and uh, we study a lot of problems together, have helped a lot of people become better leaders working together, so, you know. Yeah. And I, I love the, you know, the men or the melding of academia and, the business corporate world, you know, collaboration for that long of a time. It's almost like peanut butter and jelly in a way. It, it, I mean, that's kind of a weird analogy, but it, 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 those are two sectors that they, they try to, but uh, a lot of times you don't see it be as successful as it could be because, you know, as we talked about briefly in the pre-show, yeah, there's people that are strong in one area and there's people strong in another area. But when you try to find the best of all worlds, sometimes those connecting points aren't easily found. So, so how did, how did you guys come together uh, as far as, you know, going, you know, way back uh, yeah. to collaborate? Well, it was, I was in a, in the forest products industry at the time running manufacturing operations. And I was looking for someone to help me do leadership and organizational communication consulting. And to this day, I really don't remember how exactly we met, but we met. And there was kind of this chemistry about, you know, how he looked at things and explored things and how I looked at things and what I was looking for. And so I hired him to do consulting for me. And quickly, we started to say, well, we ought to write something about this. So we started writing articles. And um, that was, as I said in the pre-show, nearly 30 years ago now. And uh, we've been working together ever since on a consulting basis, him and I together uh, in my companies and his organizations and, um, and articles and two books, two previous books. He's written other books besides that. And I often say the collaboration has been so good for me personally that it feels like I've been in a PhD program uh, my whole career alongside of a corporate executive role. So it's been very special. Well, I, I, Michael, I, if you have time for a quick one, I'm sorry. I, I, I remember distinctly when I met uh, Bob because I was asked to make a presentation uh, about communication audits at the time. And at the time uh, when that was out, I was on the cutting edge with the, the International Communication Association developing auditing techniques to look at communication practices and organizations. And so Bob and I connected around that. And I remember, Bob, uh, we were in a meeting. I presented what we could do in terms of auditing communication practices. And Bob asked me a question. I just had my PhD. And Bob asked me, well, Phil, what does, or maybe even called me professor, uh, he said, professor, what, what does a world-class communication uh, system look like? And I stumbled through an answer, and I drove all the way home thinking that is the worst answer I could possibly give. And I had never been asked that question in all my PhD training and, and every. And, but but fortunately, he didn't. We uh, worked through that, and 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 he really challenged my thinking in a really wonderful way. And so that was the incident that I thought I'd never see him again, frankly. Uh, but uh, we did. That's amazing, and I think. Again, it speaks volumes to the character of both of you because you you both realize that okay, you are knowledgeable beyond measure in your fields, and but there's still something to learn. And you know, Bob, by you reaching out uh, to find Phil and, and understanding what you needed to do, and having that launch into books and articles and things like that is is an amazing lesson for all of us. 
you know, when we're looking for opportunities or collaboration, or you're going to hire a consultant to help out with one thing, you never know where that could end up. So it's, it's basically giving encouragement to the business owners and entrepreneurs think, you know what, get out there and do things and, and ask questions and, and bring on some people. You never know where it will take you in your career. And, and, you know, the books that have been amazing. And, you know, let's, let's segue into uh, your latest book. Uh, I, I love the title. It's very timely, you know, based on what we're seeing in the world right now. And with the great resignation and quiet quitting and organizations and trying to figure out, okay, do we work remotely? Do we have hybrid? Do we bring them back in the office? And leaders have of every walk of life, but especially, you know, leaders in organizations and in colleges and universities have had a go of it over these last few years. Uh, no one was prepared for this as much as we'd love to say that we were. I don't think anybody really truly was. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on first, and we talked about this in the pre-show, but I definitely want to bring this out in the conversation, You know how this book came to be, because it, it obviously was something that has been building for quite some time. Right. So let me start on that. Um, it has been building through all of that work we did together, which we've explained. And this was, I'll say, in the year before the pandemic, we started to percolate on what would the next book be, because it was building up. We could see these trends that you're rightly pointing out. And we started to see uh, statistics that were surfacing around issues with employee engagement and contribution and performance. That's always been an issue. But the, 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 the statistics were escalating. And the one that was probably the most stunning to us, and, and it's been updated since the pandemic, but before the pandemic, a Gallup statistic started to report data like, you know, only 15% of people, team members, are truly engaged in our organizations. Stunning number, 15%. And 70% of people say they would work harder if they felt more appreciated. And the third one, which we keyed on was 70% of leaders, people said 70% of their leaders didn't have the communication skills that they felt were necessary for that leader to lead. And you sit back and reflect on that a little bit and think about the performance lost, the contribution lost, the absenteeism achieved and all of that stuff. Um, if the leadership models that people were embracing were truly working, those statistics would be better. And if you could move the needle just a little bit on any of that, you would have a tremendously different situation. And then the other part is, you know, Fast forward through the pandemic and you start to get into the societal issues that we're dealing with and the I win, you lose behavior and the disrespect and the, the cynicism and the, I'm going to try to catch you when you're wrong kind of thinking. You layer that on top and you just wonder what leadership model could ever be put in place that would be adopted and used to solve some of those problems. And that's exactly where we position this book. We think that the beliefs and practices in this book go a long way to start uncovering what needs to be done to fix some of that. So that's my idea of the book, Phil. Well, I, to me, I mean, it was, all, it was all that, but the other thing that I kept coming back to is I would see and read, because uh, we, you know, you're, you're an academia, you read all this, and you would see all these, like, they were useful ideas, they're empowering ideas, but they were never put into action. Or you would see the reverse, where you saw people, and I've seen too many, I've observed too many people that are enormously skilled on a practice level, but they cannot they, they don't have the underlying philosophy or underlying belief structure that supports it. And so it was those twin problems I was seeing. They were flip, flip side of one another where some people had the right sentiments, but they couldn't do it because they didn't know how to do it. And then the other one, they had the, pra they had the right practices, and, but they didn't have the underlying belief structure. So they end up, 
they end up undermining it and you get things like faux engagement and uh, where people are pretending to engage when they're really not and they're, they're, they're playing a game where they're fooling each other and I would observe this um, and, I, and it would just drive me crazy a little bit because I'm like either you know the right thing to do and you're not doing it or something so I was trying to unravel that problem and I think by separating out the beliefs and the practices as we did uh, it helped us understand uh, whilst a lot of these uh, common problems are occurring, um, and, and it, a lot of it that drives me that that that, that was always uh, concerning was there's always the veneer of well, we're doing the right thing, but you go underneath it, it w wasn't there, and so you have people who who say I want to collaborate, and yet when they somebody else offers a solution that's at variance with what the leader room wants to to, to to do, they say well no we're going to do it my way, so. <laughs> It undermines the whole thing. So I've seen that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. Yes. And I'd add, I'd, I'd add one more thing that, um, the, you know, the book titled uh, Leading with Care in a Tough World, the, the caring part, it's caring about the people, but it's also caring about the outcomes. Leaders are ch challenged with bringing people together so that they're working together and engaged and you know, the, 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 the caring part helps to do that, but they also have to care about the outcomes and get the outcomes through the engagement of people. It's both together. It's not just one of those things. It's not just the results. It's not just the people. They both have to happen. Yeah, a couple of things that come to mind, especially going back to the engagement numbers and communication. We, as a society, have been getting robbed quite frankly, because organizations have not had their employees and the organization as a whole performing at its best. So that means the products and services that you and I consume aren't as good as they could be or the new innovative things that would make our lives better, whatever it could be. We may not see those things as quickly or ever because the organization is not healthy and You've got managers and leaders uh, that unfortunately are in roles where, like, like Phil said, you know, they have one thing, but they don't have the other. You know, empathy is a great example that you see a lot right now where a lot of managers and leaders don't really know how to be empathetic to their employees and the ever-changing needs that uh, employees are facing in this world. This pandemic, fast forward a lot of things. I hear countless stories of people that became caregivers. It was going to happen eventually anyway, but in a few cases, because of loss of life and, and whatever else, people became caregivers a little bit earlier than they thought they would be. That That's a dynamic that they have to navigate around in a working environment or their kids, you know, of course, you know, during the pandemic, you know, people figured out really quick. It's like, wait a minute, the kids are in school at the same time that I normally work. And how are we going to do all of that at the same time? And yeah. it didn't work well. So a lot of people working longer hours and they were stressed and fatigued and tossed in the fact that we were dealing with a pandemic and a virus that were killing a lot of people. So there's just a lot of dynamics in there. But, you know, going back to the care component, I think, you know, from my observation, that is one area that there's so much room for improvement and for consultants that you know, specialize in that type of work to start reaching out to organizations to help their managers and their leaders to learn how to kind of care. And like you said, you know, yes, care for your people, take care of them so they feel valued and they don't feel like a number, but also by doing that, creating an environment where as a manager or leader, when I was leading organizations, my number one priority was make sure that everybody has everything that they need to thrive in their role, right. All the, whatever tools, whatever they need, they need time away. Great. Go for it set them up for success I mean, to the point where they might be so good that they will leave. And I've had amazing talent leave my organization. I gave them the reference. They, they had the confidence to come to me and say, it's not you, but there's an opportunity that gives me a, a little bit better career path for what I want to do in life. I'm like, awesome. Who do I need to speak to about the reference? 
and I would give them a reference. It's like, I'm the boss, the current boss giving a reference and, <laughs> and no, it wasn't their best friend. It was, you know, I was there and I, I told them, I said, you know, I, this is a better opportunity for them. I hate to lose them, but I want what's best for them. And when you start approaching things like that, all of a sudden, and we all know the organizations that thrive at this, that have people that never leave those organizations because they're taken care of. It's not because they don't want to go. Right. And we, we've seen that in the last couple of years with you know over 4 million Americans every month for a you know, good year plus are leaving you know, their right. jobs. And quitting a job is not easy. It's not, it's not just a, I quit. You know, there's a lot of things you have to navigate through. So organizations that lead with care are going to be the ones that are going to not only survive the next bit, but in all likelihood will thrive because we'll thrive. They're, they're creating the environment for people to want to do their best work and actually stay. And that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, you're making a really important point here because the word care is not a word that's traditionally you know, tossed around in the leadership circles yet, but it needs to be. I mean, the, the word that's tossed around in leadership circles now is servant leadership. And you notice that we position the book as, as, uh, as beyond servant leadership. We, we uh, aspire to all of that that, that uh, was written about, is written about in servant leadership. But being a servant to someone else has a little bit different meaning than saying, that I really care about this person and their career and the outcomes and how they interact with this organization. It's a deeper, more long lasting, more enduring relationship. And that's the thing we think that needs to happen to create the engagement that we're missing so desperately. Interesting enough, that was, uh, you put your finger on what was a major source of discussion at the beginning of writing this book, because, uh, I, I think we talked a lot about what do we mean by caring? Uh, what does that word mean? And how is it different from the word servant? And uh, I think what Bob and I came up with and what I think I'm really, I mean, I know I'm really proud of is that we were able to say there's a different difference between kind of shallow caring versus a deeper, deeper caring that really says, I'm not just interested in knowing emotionally what's going on, that's important, but we want to add to that thoughtfulness about your career, thoughtfulness about your situation, um, education about how you can get better and what you just said, empowering people to do the very best work that they can on the job. And that's a deeper kind of caring that I would consider is more genuine in some ways than sometimes what gets passed off as caring. And so it's you have to be very careful with that word. But I know that Bob and I had a long discussion about, and not, it's not one, but many discussions about how to position that word in a way that, that really captures what we have. And we start the book off with that, as a matter of fact. You know, it's a great thing. And it reminds me of a story the last used to work in healthcare and I ran healthcare clinics and the last clinic that I ran, I came in originally as an interim leader because the, I was replacing another interim leader that replaced a leader that uh, was let go. Uh, there was some issues uh, that they had between the board and this leader. So, but long story short in their history, at that point, when I arrived, they had been around as an organization for about four years and they were averaging over 80% turnover every year that's eight eight zero and it wasn't a mcdonald's it wasn't teenagers doing their first job and working a week and then leaving no this was medically trained master's level type people clinicians and they were just leaving because the environment was so toxic so i went into there going okay challenge accepted let's see what we can do and went in and after my first year there uh the number dropped from 80 something percent to six percent yeah. and everybody asked what did you do did you just get rid of everybody and bring everybody in and they all liked you no i there was only one person that we moved on and you know several dozen people um this wasn't the right fit but all i did was i came in and i met with every one of those individuals individually and, and asked them okay 
in your opinion, what's worked well here? What hasn't? This is non-judgmental. And I did it as an interim too. That, so I was smart because like, look, I'm interim. So you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> Fooled them. Guess what? I became permanent for, was there for four years. Uh, but uh, I didn't know that at that point. I wouldn't have said, you know, I'm just going to try to hide and pretend. No, I, I said, look, I'm interim. So I, I don't know if I'm going to be here long-term, but you know, let, let's take this opportunity and hash some things out. And we did, and people shared, and there were things that they wanted that were really easy to implement. And I did. It's like, okay, we can, we can do that. Well, that's what's striking. I mean, the two things that I picked up from what you just said are number one, you were very thoughtful in how you approached, you, you approached everybody and you were able to, to work with them in a really powerful way and understand what their goals were. And then, then, and then you adapted and, 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 and asked very simple questions. And a lot of the stuff is simple, but if you have, if you have the right, right pieces of it together, that's when the power emerges. Yeah. So you had an underlying belief in, in people and you had an underlying belief that uh, we could do this together and treating people with respect. And then that allowed you to move forward. So yeah. it sounds simple, but sometimes it's not. And you know, the old adage is that people don't leave organizations, they leave people. And they leave the environment that those leaders create. And that environment's created at every level, whether it's you know one supervisor and two employees, or whether it's thousand people in an organization and one CEO and everything in between, that environment is, is established by the style and the approach and the beliefs and practices of the leaders. And what we tried to do here is do our very best to identify five core beliefs that we think these kinds of caring leaders need to have, and then nine practices that uh, intertwine with those beliefs to discharge the beliefs in, in the real world. And, you know, there may be more, but we think it's a great start. And it's put together in a way that, that comprehensively looks at a system of leadership that's different than other approaches. We're not going to give them all that because I want them to buy the book. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, yeah, that's the whole yeah, that's the whole idea because yeah. this, this yeah. is a yeah. book that belongs on on every bookshelf. But if there was one, we'll say, core belief that you find in your work time and time again is something that every organization really should take a longer look at, what would that be? Well, I would. I'll start with that. There's a, there's a chapter in the first section of the book on values, and it lists several values. You know, you can get a list of values that's a mile long. I think we picked out eight or nine, but some of them are things like uh, honesty, trust, respect, humility. And if people could count on their leaders just to tell the truth and be honest, and transparent about what's going on, that goes a long way. If you get, the, so the, the, the whole point of that is, if you get certain values right, everything else is easy. Everything else is a lot easier. If you get the values wrong, for example, if you can't trust someone or if you, they're not being transparent or they're not being honest, I don't know how you back yourself out of that from a leadership standpoint and convince anybody to be more engaged. So the values are everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. From my perspective, it's uh, embracing uncertainty, uh, that, that great leaders have to learn to embrace uncertainty uh, and, and, and know uh, what they don't know as well as what they do know. And I, I think that's foundational. It's not, and I agree with Bob on the values, but if you ask me one idea that's probably a lot of people haven't thought about is the power of embracing uncertainty and how that has to infuse everything that, that a leader does. Otherwise, you're gonna come off as a know-it-all and people are gonna work into their silos and just work in a very narrow range uh, and kind of have this, what I call gig mentality um, and that's the silent, you know, where people are quitting, they're doing their job, but they're quitting. And I, I think that's what's happening. Uh, so, you know, I think those go hand in hand, but you have to couple all that. We always think of it as a lattice that grows together because they, 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 they go together to be successful. 
you got to be aware of the with regarding with regard to embracing uncertainty you got to be aware be aware of people who won't need to be the smartest person in the room that's not a leader's role to be the smartest person in the room no their their job is to lead and, and lead a team to do all of their great work and when they do that it makes a world of difference and that's when you start having strong organizations and and creating great products and services that society needs so Gentlemen, I've loved this conversation. Talk hours and hours about this. So where can people find out more about you, the book, and other things you're working on? Well, well there's a book website. It's leadingwithcare.net. And uh, all the information about the two of us is on there. And other books that we've written and other work that we've done. There's a blog. There's videos about the book that, that characterize certain uh, sections of the book to give them a uh, uh, preamble and what to expect when they buy the book. So leadingwithcare.net. That's awesome. And I'll definitely have that in the show notes. So Bob, Phil, thank you so much for this book. Thank you so much for the work that you've done over the years and continued success and everything that you're doing. Thank you for your thank interest you, and really good to see you today.